Welcome to the Bless Carla Wakuta's Project teaching videos. In this teaching video, we're going to be talking about the sacrament of confession um, based around the content of the catechism section 4.1 to 4.18. Uh, so just as always, Father Eamon, you might like to lead us in a prayer to begin with. Thanks, Eileen. So as a prayer this, uh, for this video, I might read a piece from Scripture. This is from uh, the letter to the Colossians in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness and patience, forbearing one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Eamon. So we have a lot of questions for this week's video on confession. And um, so maybe I'll just get started with the first one. And um, it's an important question. So who has the power to forgive sins? So in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, they knew uh, rightly that only God could forgive sins. And that makes sense because when we sin, uh, we might offend our neighbor, but we certainly offend God as well. So because he is offended, only he can forgive sins. So the Jewish people, they were always a little bit anxious and they didn't know fully uh, if God forgave them their sins. But the, an amazing thing happened then. Uh, Jesus came on earth. He was the Christ. And in his ministry, he said to people, your sins are forgiven. And that was a, a shocking thing to their ears because no one had ever said that. Even the priests of the Old Testament never said that. But here is this man, Jesus of Galilee, saying, your sins are forgiven. And people, of course, accused him of blasphemy. You can't say that. You can't say your sins are forgiven. But, of course, he was God and he could forgive sins. And this was one of his signs that he indeed was God and he could forgive sins. And how refreshing was that to the person he said those words to, your sins are forgiven. Because always before that, people didn't really know if God forgave them their sins. They knew God was merciful. But they never heard those lovely words of reassurance in their ears. Your sins are forgiven. And another great sign of God's mercy was the resurrection. If God was willing to, to raise Jesus up as the head of the human race, it's the great sign that the relationship between the human race and God has been healed. Lovely. Thanks, Father Eamon. Um, that's very nicely explained because, of course, like you said in the Old Testament, the people didn't hear those words directly, maybe, or else it was through the words of a prophet. They were called to repent and they often had very visible ways of showing that they were repenting. Um, but, you know, we're very blessed that through Christ's revelation that uh, we have a direct way for him to show us that our sins are forgiven. And so our second question then um, is kind of related to that. Where did the sacrament of confession come from? So Jesus had this power to forgive sins. Now he wanted to, to grant this power to his apostles, his future bishops and priests, that they would continue his ministry of forgiveness after he returned to heaven. So this is what he did. He said to his apostles, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth will be considered bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be considered loosed in heaven. And this is why we always see St. Peter, but we see him with keys in his hand. So now in the church, it is the priests who have the power to forgive sins in the sacrament of confession. 
Another moment in the gospel that's very important here regarding the sacrament of reconciliation or confession is that moment after the resurrection when Jesus met his disciples in the upper room. He appeared to them as the risen Jesus. He had risen from the dead. And the gospel says that he breathed his spirit on them. And he said, peace be with you. Those whose sins you forgive, they will be forgiven. Those whose sins you retained, they will be retained. And we see here in this that there is a link now between the death and resurrection of Jesus and this power to forgive sins. Because the forgiveness of sins is really, uh, it's really new life for the soul. It's, it's a share in our Lord's resurrection. It's being brought back from the dead, essentially. The sacrament of reconciliation is called a healing sacrament. It's not for the priest to give out to the penitent. It's for the priest to be a minister of God's mercy. Jesus didn't give out to his apostles when he appeared to them after the resurrection. You know, they had run away. They had been afraid and cowardly. They didn't stand by him during his crucifixion. But when he came back after the resurrection, he said, my peace be with you. And he breathed on them, just like God breathed on the dust when he made Adam in the creation story. He's breathing on them again and giving them new life. He's recreating them. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? That, uh, you know, Christ was so generous in that sense that he would make that uh, grace of the forgiveness of sins, I suppose, possible even after his own physical uh, presence on earth and that all that he did in a way when he was forgiving the sins of those that he encountered was a way of leading by example for the apostles of the grace he was going to give them, even though they themselves are sinners. And of course, you know, Christ uh, had no sin. <laughs> um, but I suppose that helps us to understand it mm. when we know that that, power or grace comes from christ himself and so our next question um pertains to the sacrament um so uh, our next question is what makes confession a sacrament and can you remind us of what a sacrament is so what a sacrament is eileen is an outward sign of an inward grace or a visible sign of an invisible grace. And just to explain that, so what an outward sign is, it's something we can see or hear or taste in the case of the Eucharist or feel with water being poured in our head in baptism. So something tangible, a bodily experience through which God gives us his grace, his life, his blessing. And that's the, that's the inward grace then we receive in our soul. And in the sacrament of confession, what you have is a, a human experience, the priest and the penitent together. They speak to each other, so there's, there's voice and there's hearing, and there's the words uttered by the priest. So that's what a sacrament is. It's a real human bodily encounter through which God imparts his grace, and in this case, the grace of healing, the grace of forgiveness. Lovely. Thanks very much for that, Father Eamon. And uh, now our next question is, uh, what are the different elements of um, the sacrament of confession? Firstly, we have that the penitent must be sorrowful. We call this repentance. They must be sorry for their sins. And within that, then, there's, there's a resolution that you don't want to sin this way again. So you have what's called a firm purpose of amendment. You're going to do your best not to sin again. The second element then is just that you must, you must utter your sins. You must confess your sins to the priest. You must say all your sins, as many as you can think of. And your conscience inside you will help you remember your sins. And of course, you must say them all, especially if you've got a serious sin, like a mortal sin. And the priest will help you understand which sins are venial sins and which sins are mortal sins, but you certainly have to confess your mortal sins. And the third element then for the penitent in confession is you must make up for your sins. So the priest will give you some penance to do after confession. 
and that will make up for your sin. Or if you've stolen something, you'll have to make up for your sin by returning what you stole. So, And then on behalf of the priest, the priest gives you absolution. And our next question, Father Eamon, is how can we prepare to make a good confession? Can you give us maybe some tips for uh, making a good confession? One I will s start with is go to confession regularly. If you leave it more than a month, if you leave it to two or three months, what happens is you won't remember your sins. You'll get out of the habit of thinking of confession. So you should go monthly for that reason. And between confessions, get into the habit of remembering your sins. Tell yourself, I must bring this to confession in my next confession. Okay, my second tip is, every night if you can, when you're doing your night prayer, as part of your night prayer, and I know for our Blessed Carlo project we do this, we do a little examination of conscience. So we ask ourselves, how have I sinned today? And it also helps us to remember our sins then for confessions. It's very useful to have an examination of conscience. This is a list, especially when you're young and a teenager. And I'll put I'll put a list in uh, as a link in the below the video. You can you can see an examination of conscience, and I'll put one on the project website as well. And this goes through the Ten Commandments and all the ways we can possibly sin. And this very often helps, especially a young person or a teenager. And the list then will will remind them of their sins and prompt them where they may have sins. It's called an examination of conscience. Another tip is don't ever be afraid to ask a priest to have your confession heard. Even in COVID times, it's even in COVID times, it's very easy for the priest to set up a room and keep your distance and have your confession. So if you have to ring up a priest, ask your parents to bring you to a priest. Um, don't be don't be shy about that. I would say as well that, you know, you're probably in the habit of your parents bringing you to confession and your parents making the move. As teenagers, all the Blessed Carlo group, I think it's, it's now time that you take responsibility and you tell your parents when you need to go to confession. Don't be shy about that. When you're at confession with the priest, tell the priest all your sins. Don't tell the priest for sins, but conceal this other sin that you're just too embarrassed to admit. You just have to be strong enough and trust the priest. And priests are trained not to be shocked. We've heard all these sins again and again. We, we won't be shocked. We're ministers of mercy. So just be strong and tell the priest, be humble. Tell the priest all of your sins, don't conceal any of them. If you do sin, never fall into despair. You know, the devil, he wants us to sin and he also wants us to fall into despair after we sin. So when we sin, we should be sorry, but not so sorry that we can't approach God. God wants us to approach him even after we sin, especially after we sin, because he, he always longs to give us his mercy. If you think of the, the story of the prodigal son in the Gospel of Luke, the father was waiting for the prodigal son to come back and he clasped him in his arms in mercy when the son came back. When you confess your sins to the priest in confession, you must be clear to the priest what the sin is. Don't be vague. Tell the priest. You must give the priest a clear idea of what you have done. So be clear as to the number of times. Tell the truth and shame the devil, as they say. Remember that many of the great saints sinned badly. St. Augustine is one of the most famous saints, one of the greatest saints in the church. He had uh, a mistress, a concubine. He had a baby with this concubine. Now sins, we always want to avoid sins, that's true. But in a strange way, we can benefit from the experience of sinning and receiving forgiveness from God. Think again of the prodigal son. Think how much he knew, how much his father loved him after the whole episode of sinning and returning. In the end, the whole experience was very beneficial to him, whereas the, the older son, he never knew the mercy of his father. But there also can be sins of thought. So when we have jealous thoughts, when we have prideful thoughts, we can bring those to the confession box as well. A sins of omission or another one where we could have helped someone or shown, shown someone some love and didn't. 
that's called a sin of omission. Um, so other mental sins would be maybe fantasizing, um, where we're, you know, taking pleasure from our fantasies. So our sins aren't always actions or words, they can be thoughts as well. So that's a lot there. I think uh, we'll have to get them down in writing. <laughs> Um, but no, it's great because they're helpful because like you mentioned there, there's a lot of things there that I think we can all relate to in some shape or form, maybe being a bit vague about what our sin was or, you know, that feeling of um, embarrassment or even, you know, that need for greater humility and, um, you know, just even sharing those stories of the saints. I, I remember, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi maybe said, if God can work through me, he can work through anyone. Uh, you know, so they they had to experience that conversion and uh, that mercy of God. And I'm sure even after, uh, you know, that road to sanctity, of course, they they still needed God's mercy, you know, but it was that fact that they turned back to him like a child uh, who falls often but gets back up to their father again um, is so important. So uh, thank you so much for sharing those. And I think it will be very helpful. And so now our next question is um, one that maybe some people might ask. Uh, so some people might say that instead of confession, that we can just speak to Jesus directly and tell him that we are sorry as he already knows our sins. Um, how do we respond to that question? I think we should speak to Jesus directly and to God directly. I think we should do it every night. I said it earlier that when we say our night prayers at night, we should examine our conscience and at that moment say sorry to God. So that's a form of saying sorry to God directly. We should do it all the time. But with that, God has already indicated strongly to us that he wants to impart his graces through the sacraments. And confession, as I said earlier, is a sacrament of a human encounter with another person where you come face to face with the priest. And it's a very, very real encounter. A doctor cannot heal you unless you tell him your symptoms, tell him how you're, you're suffering, and maybe until he examines you with his stethoscope and so forth. So the same with the, the healing and confession. You need to go and see the priest. You know, in the next life, Eileen, when we go to meet our, our maker, when we die and we go to the next life, we will meet Jesus he will be our judge. Thankfully, he is a merciful judge. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. But in our judgment, we will come before him face to face. And the question is, will we be able to look him in the eye when we meet him? So our next question is, what is the seal of confession and what does it mean? So the seal of confession is just the, the assurance that Whatever the penitent says to the priest in confession, the priest will never repeat that to anyone, not the person's parents, not the guardi, <laughs> not another priest, not the bishop. So our final question, Father Eamon, is how is confession related to the death and resurrection of Jesus? In confession, when the priest prays the prayer of absolution, he says, God, the Father of all mercies, has reconciled the world to himself through the death and resurrection of his Son and sent the Holy Spirit into the world for the forgiveness of sins. So this tells us that we don't come to the confession box alone. In confession, Jesus is with us. He is on our side, vouching for us as our brother before God, and he has already made a sacrifice of atonement for our sins. And that is why we often see a crucifix in a confession box. That's lovely. Thanks, Father Eamon. Um, I actually remember one time, just a final note, um, that in a confessional I was in, uh, there was a lovely quote inside in the confessional uh, saying, Blood of Jesus, uh, tears of Mary, heal my soul, um, which was a quote from a venerable, venerable Bruno Lanteri, who was um, an Italian priest. Uh, but I thought it was a lovely thing to have inside the confessional, very encouraging and reminding us again that, uh, you know, God has, uh, I suppose, uh, given us his son to make us his children, you know, by Jesus' blood. So, mm. uh, yeah. 
Thank you, Eileen. And, you know, in the early church, confession was more public. Penitents, when they sinned, they had to go before the whole community, the whole church, and confess their sin out loud to everyone. And when they did penance, that was more public as well. After time, however, the, the form of confession changed. It was the Irish monks in the 6th century, um, St. Mm. Columbanus, for example, suggested it be done a little bit differently. But the priest alone is sufficient to represent the community. So it was the Irish monks, and they brought this over to Europe, who introduced one-to-one -one confession. That's great. So we should be very thankful to our Irish monks, so then... <laughs> It's a little bit easier than it used to be. And Much see... easier. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's a lovely, um, interesting fact as well. So, uh, <laughs> and a great contribution, yeah, to the church as well. An encouraging mm -hmm. confession in a maybe easier way. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks a million, Father Eamon. Maybe have you some uh, final words to sum up this video? Just to encourage everyone to make use of the sacrament of confession. You know, there's so many benefits from the sacrament of confession. We, so we receive new strength every time we go to confession. We receive graces that make us stronger, more virtuous. Brilliant. Thanks, Father Eamon. Uh, so maybe we will finish our video with a final prayer and uh, just remembering all our students and all those who will watch this video as well. Thanks, Eileen. So again, I'll finish with a piece of scripture in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippines. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Carlo Acutis, pray, pray for, for us. us.